Progress. Okay, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. And uh, let's begin this study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the blessings of the Sabbath and of fellowship. We're thankful, Lord, for the things that you've been teaching us uh, throughout uh, these last few years, and especially um, the messages of this past week that have been such a blessing. We pray for each person. We know the needs that we have, and you know the requests upon our heart. You know the struggles that we face, personal struggles, and um, you know the time that we are living in, which presents uh, challenges that um, are life and death. And so we just ask, Lord, that as we study together, that you can direct this study, that you can guide our minds, and that you can bring us into a closer relationship with you. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it looks like I'm picking up where uh, Dwight left off this morning. Um, now, this is, of course, um, Revelation chapter 13. And we're looking at this beast, this two-horned beast, which is going to, uh, and I'm just going to read this section here. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And we know that the speaking of this beast is its legislation. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell, there, dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. That first beast is the papal beast. Now, the papal beast is, is a continuation or modification or a transition from pagan Rome, which is also a beast. And that's the beast of Revelation chapter 12. And we know that when we go through this chapter, it's going to deal with a, a mark called the mark of the beast. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. So what is the primary... Um, means by which people are going to be controlled in the end times, that they're going to worship the beast and his image, according to these, these passages here. It would look to be legislation, but consent to the legislation. Okay, but so there's legislation, but this legislation is going to do what? What's the idea? Why, why are people being controlled by this legislation? Because they're willing to give up their freedom for what they see as being security. Okay, right. So, so we can look at it, they can't buy or sell. Right. And, yeah, and, and why is that important to be able to buy and sell? What, it, what is this? What is buying and selling about many are no longer as self-sufficient as they used to be so they must buy and sell for their food for their shelter for <clears throat> anything that they believe to be important okay so so we're dealing with with the economy here right i mean that's one of the things we see in this dealing with the mark of the beast, that there's something to do with the economy. And people are not um, self-sufficient. I mean, we live in an extremely 
complex economy. It used to really always bother me. I'd think about the infrastructure that exists and how, you know, if that in infrastructure is affected, how our world could just fall apart, right? And of course, we have lots of different types of scenarios uh, that people imagined, like with uh, um, Y2K, for instance, you know, the, 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 the world was going to come to an end because um, the power grid was going to go down because the computers couldn't ha handle it. We wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. Now, of course, if we were living in um, the early 1900s, uh, that wouldn't have mattered, right? I mean, we lived in in a world where, I mean, our, our we were poorer. I know at least my grandparents were pretty poor. They, my mom was born in a dirt hut uh, with a dirt floor. Um, you know, people people had very very little, but they were self sufficient. They had enough food and enough clothing and enough shelter uh, to get by. And you know, somebody living in in a high rise building, if the power goes out. Uh, especially in Canada in the middle of winter, maybe in Arkansas in the middle of summer, um, they could easily die, right? So so we have a world that is uh, an economy, and we would also say we have a global economy. So one of the things we're going to look at, and I'm going to need a little bit of discussion here because I'm not sure where everyone uh, – where their knowledge is regarding economics and and in trying to understand this problem of what's happening around us presently i mean i think most of us would be fiscally conservative we would believe in uh, the constitution that men have a right to make their own choices we wouldn't be communists or socialists and um, we wouldn't look at government as the answer uh, to the problems that face society. We would look at government mostly as the problem that faces society. I would assume that most of us would be in that position uh, philosophically. But we're going to examine that a little bit. And, and, I'm, and I've struggled how to do this. I mean, economics is a broad field of study. Um, and then, and I've been studying it, you know, for 13 years, but to sort, I've never really had to explain it, um, especially in any kind of presentation. But we're going to look at some of the basic prim, pr, uh, principles of economics and, and try to look at what's happening. So with the World Economic Forum, one of the things we see with it is it has the word economic in it, right? Which, you know, you have the idea that it's really all about economics. It's a forum or a place of discussion where different kinds of ideas can be shared. That, and, and it's World Economic Forum, so it's a forum that in, would include the whole world. But it really pre represents a small view of what we would call economics, and it would be an elitist view and, and very much a fashionable view. That is, if we look at economics uh, through the centuries, uh, economic thought and how people have thought about the economy, um, what we see presently happening is, is a resurgence of, of um, a, the idea of a controlled economy or a state-run economy. But in this case, it's not necessarily the state. Who would be in the World Economic Forum, for those that you know, who would be in charge of the economy? Who should be in charge of the economy? What, what are the players involved? Is it, is it just the government? No. So who else is included? You have those like Klaus Schwab. You have others that uh, that believe that they should be more making the decisions for other people because they view their own intelligence as being so much greater than anyone else's. Right. So the, it's an, the idea that the elite should run the economy 
and the elite is decided by uh, what standard? Who decides who the elite are? Well, according to the elites, it's because they have so much more than everyone else. Right. So it's the wealthy, right? Right. So, so the people who have all of the money are the ones who think that they know best how governments should run the economy. Now, you know, sometimes what the World Economic Forum is sort of characterized, and, and I've done this as well, is sort of communist. Uh, because there there are elements within this idea of uh, a state-run uh, economy, which is a characteristic of communism. But um, some people would just characterize it as socialism or Marxism. Um, but it's kind of a mixture of different things, and and it's not easy because one of one of the problems that we face is that we throw around all kinds of terms political terms and economic terms that are not really well defined. It is we quite understand how the economy works. And, and that's because we've been brainwashed to a large extent by our education, by the media. So, you know, one of the things I find kind of interesting, because I've been reading lots about uh, the pandemic and did the governments do a good job? And, and, and it's interesting because how did they decide if the government's done a good job? What's, what's generally, if the media is going to give a report on how the government did regarding the pandemic, what are they going to look at to decide how the government did? Uh, anybody know what generally you will see in the, in the media? How do you decide if the government did a good job or not? We'll Where just look at. Yeah. Jeff. OK, Jeff, I'm not hearing you. You said look at. That's all I heard. Um, they look, yeah, they look at st statistics. I know that. Okay, so one is they don't. I mean, they well, use somebody is informing them. Well, they use or misinforming them. Yeah, so they use statistics. I wouldn't say they look at statistics, uh, because that's just part of when you present something, you have to make it look like it's scientific or objective. So you're you're going to present some statistics, but mostly what they look at is public opinion. So. When, when I did research on this to try to find out, mostly what you got was uh, like Pew Research or different uh, uh, polling systems decide asking people in various countries how they thought their country did, their government did in response to the pandemic. Now, is, is that a very good way of deciding whether the government did a good job or not, public no. opinion? Okay, what's the problem there? How do you quantify opinions? Well, 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 yeah, and also where does the opinion come from? Mostly this would be a perception that would come through the media. So if the media is telling you your government did a good job, you're, you're probably mostly going to just accept that, especially if your situation isn't that bad. You're not really going to know how other people's situations are. So now you'll have something like, let's say, 55% say the government did a good job and and 45% say they didn't, you know. Um, well, usually the 45%, it, it, I mean, they, they might actually be in a worse situation than they were before, which is might be why they express that. But even some of the 55% might be in a worse situation, but they're told that it would have been worse if the government hadn't intervened. So, so people may just be going by what they hear in the media. So um, it would be like if you took a survey uh, to find out uh, what the average IQ is of a population and you asked people what they thought their IQ was. Um, I don't think you would get 100 uh, as being the average. 
uh, I remember a friend of mine, she well, it was my daughter's friend. She uh, did an IQ test on Facebook and, and she had, I think, like 92. And she was uh, all excited all excited because that's the highest mark she'd ever had. She'd never got a mark that high before. Um, not realizing that 92 is below average, but um, so so public opinion is not really a good way to decide how things happen. Now, what about statistics? So somebody brought up statistics. Um, are statistics in and of themselves a good way of deciding um, anything? You're asking an interesting question because my mind goes back to when I was leaving academy. The teacher that was tasked with teaching economic theory okay. handed me a book and the book was how to lie with statistics <laughs> yeah so when we're dealing with economic theory i mean the some of the some of the schools of thought run to keynesian theory which is very socialist yeah friedman and Friedman is very much free market. Well, the Chicago school. Okay. Yeah. So the two are at odds with each other in how they would approach. Now, the government, especially the government since the 1930s, runs more according to Keynesian theory. They like to ignore what Friedman has had to say because they can't control what the way that Friedman's model works. Right. Right. So governments like Keynesian economics because it's something where governments can control the, the economy or at least have the appearance of doing something. So not everybody here is going to know the difference between Keynesian economics and um, the Chicago School and also the Austrian School, which is uh, because that's um, basically Ludwig von Mises, who developed an understanding of how economics works. Um, now, there are differences, too. So Keynesian is, you know, well, it, it would be based on a free market economy. Um, and Keynesianism, uh, which is I'm trying to think of the guy's first name, but. John something Keynes. I can't think of what his name. John Maynard Keynes. Maynard, that's it. Yeah, so John Maynard Keynes, Milton Friedman, and Ludwig von Mises. And and uh, you also have Hayek in there as one of these leading uh, thinkers on economics. Now, the problem, of course, Keynesian, which we would say is more a socialist way of looking at things, that is governments... Um, what is the interest of government? So uh, one of the one of the things that we have to look at in in any sort of analysis of of a person's view, any kind of view that a person has, is what is the primary motivation that a person has in holding a view? So why would governments like Keynesian economics, as you said? What is it that Keynesian economics allows governments to do? to direct the effort, to control the output, and to set the prices. Right. So this allows them to make it look like they're doing something. Right? Exactly. Now, I remember I, I used to work as a security guard in, in a shopping mall, a large mall, which we have a lot of those in, in Canada because the winters are cold, so um, – you know, people want to go shopping inside. So we had these indoor malls and I was a security guard and um, they fired me. Um, and, and they had two reasons. One is they said I was too nice. So, you know, I was supposed to sort of take care of the, the rowdies in the food court and stuff like that. And, you know, there'd be teenagers acting up or causing a disturbance. Um, but the other thing is, I never looked like I was busy, and um, 
And I learned, I talked to a security guard in another mall and he says, the secret is to always make it look like you're busy. So you need to rush from place to place. You don't actually have to do anything, but you need to make it look like you're doing something. And, and that's kind of what governments are like. People are going to elect governments that they think are doing something, um, even if what the government's doing is actually destructive, uh, that doesn't really matter. So governments have figured out that the more they act, the more people think that they're uh, responding. But governments actually are powerless in the world of economics, other than to destroy economies. Governments really don't have the power to uh, create economic growth. And why is that? What is what is the driver of ec economic growth? Growth. If anybody. Innovation. Okay. People Innov that, are, that are willing to put forth the effort to accomplish something. Okay. Yeah. So, so there is people do things. That is, people act. Um, in Austrian economics, they call it practic praxeology. That is, uh, the the basic economic principle is that people make choices. They choose how to. Uh, use their time. So, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to avoid too much economic jargon and stuff. So I'm trying to make this simple. But basically, every time, like if you choose to sit here and listen to me talk on a Sabbath afternoon, that's because you've chosen to do this rather than something else. So I thank you for that. Um, so you've actually showed that you put value in something over something else. Now, value itself is subjective. That is, each person uh, makes a decision uh, with his time, how they're going to use it, how they're going to value something. And, and there isn't such a thing as objective value. Okay, so Angela says she doesn't mind economic jargon as long as it's defined. So, and, and I use the term praxeology. You could look it up, but it's the idea that people act. And people act according to the choices that they make. That is, you always choose something over something else. Um, but we have this idea that things have a quantifiable value. So, for instance, um, well, I used to own a guitar store. My son used to. It's sold now. But um, uh, if somebody comes in and buys a guitar, and that guitar is a certain price, and let's say... Um, uh, let's say in my guitar store, let's say we got hundreds and hundreds of guitars, which there's a, there's a few hundred, but, um, and somebody wants to buy a guitar and they decide that they, they don't have enough money to buy the guitar they want, but they're going to try to get a bargain. Um, if I have lots of guitars and I need money, that is, uh, I've sort of overextended myself in purchasing guitars and somebody offers me a money, I might just take that money even if I'm not making much on that guitar. Now, why do I do that? What What is the principle involved here? Why does, why would I, I sell a guitar to somebody? Let's say I have, uh, I have a model of guitar that I've had in for a long time and I got five of them, that same guitar. And I haven't sold any of them for a year. And a person comes in and they offer me, basically, I almost make no profit on it. Maybe I don't even make a profit. Maybe I'm just going to sell it for what I paid for it. Why would I do that? To make it look like you're making a profit? Because, because the state has told you to take pity on the, the poor person coming in and that they want to control how much you're able to make because well, you're no. really a capitalist. I don't know about that. Well, the thing is I need the money and, and I have lots of those guitars. And so sometimes I need that money more than I need the guitar. The reason I sell any guitar is because I actually want the, the money more than I want the guitar. Right. Well, and, and we can see that the guitar and the money are not equal. Right. If they were equal, I wouldn't make the exchange. Okay. In a situation like this, 
Yeah. We are exchanging goods and services for capital, right? Well, all of them are capital. Everything that we exchange is capital, whether it's capital goods or whether it's money. Oh, no, what, what, what I'm getting at, that's why I said goods and services. Okay. okay. Now, here's, here's a, a, a situation. Okay. Let's say we need the service of an attorney. Okay. And that attorney has a specific specialty. Mm -hmm. but the attorney charges $400 an hour and you only have the ability to pay $100. Yeah. Are you going to have much success in negotiating with an attorney that has that kind of a rate if all you can afford to pay is 25% of their going fee? No. So, your value of your capital is less because you're not able to obtain the service that you desire. Yeah. Now, in this situation, under Keynesian economics, yeah. everybody should be able to obtain the goods and services that they desire because the state sets the price and says you as the provider can only charge this and you as the customer would need to pay this. Well, in Canada, we have legal aid. So if, if I mean, this is a little more complicated situation than I wanted to discuss, but, but in Canada, you have legal aid. So let's say you can't afford a lawyer. Um, the government will step in and help you. And it's sort of like a loan. You can get the lawyer, uh, but you have to pay it over a long period of time. So the lawyer gets his money, though he gets a lower rate. So they're less likely to get a good lawyer. But, uh, but the principle I want to set up here, so the principle I want to set up is how value is determined. So in a free market, value is determined based upon a subjective uh, assessment of value. So I'm going to try to simplify it a, a little bit. So let's say I have, um, you know, I have five guitars, the same guitar, the same model. And I haven't sold them for a long time. And somebody comes in and wants to buy that guitar. I might be willing to lower that price because I need money. But then the next person comes in and he wants to buy the same guitar. But I now have the money. That is, I have something I didn't have before. Maybe I had some bill I had to pay, so I was willing to sell that guitar for less. But the next guy, he comes in, and, and he tries to, to get me to go lower. And I go a bit lower, but not as low as the first person. So now I've sold two of those five guitars. Uh, the first one I sold quite cheap, maybe the, just the cost. The next one I maybe made 10%. And then... Um, and then I have another person come in after them and they want to buy one of those guitars. And, you know, they, they want to negotiate the price and maybe I throw in a set of strings, you know, and they're happy with that. They buy the guitar. And then another person comes in and he wants to buy that guitar. Well, you know, I'm not willing to negotiate. He buys that guitar. Now, a fifth person comes in, I have one of those guitars left. And I decide there's such a demand for these guitars, I'm, I'm going to raise the price on that guitar. And I, I'm going to raise it, you know, 15%. And that next person comes in, and I sell it to him for 15% more than, than the price I was asking, you know, a few hours before. Now, did each of those persons pay a fair price? For that guitar is the question did i rip off the last person well as an average the answer would be yes but in reality the answer would be no 
Okay. Well, the value, maybe the value went up on the Qatars. Okay. So, so, so somebody may, let's say the first person, um, you know, and the last person happened to be friends and, and they get together. And the one guy said, well, how much do you pay for that guitar? And he said, and he said, well, that was more than he was asking for it. And the other guy says, I got it for like half that cost. Um, so the, so the last guy comes in and says that I overcharged him. But the reality is the value of a guitar is not a fixed thing. It depends upon supply and demand. It also depends upon the person's willingness to buy something, how much they're willing to spend, and the person's uh, willingness to part with something, how much they're willing to sell it for. And what you don't have is an equal thing. That is, if the value of the guitar is equal to the value of the money, then there's no reason that anybody would make the exchange. That is, the person wants to have the guitar more than the money that he has, and the person who has the guitar wants the money more than the guitar that he has. And you can't quantify value. Now, another example would be if somebody comes into the store and they're very poor, they, they, you know, they're not homeless, but they live in pretty much poverty and they want to buy a guitar. And, and they're going to buy the least expensive guitar I have. But I could have somebody who has tons of money. They're a multimillionaire. And they come into the store. And they're going to buy the most expensive guitar I have. And, and they're not even going to negotiate. And they're going to buy all the accessories. They're going to buy the, the most expensive capo and, and the nicest case. And, and maybe they're going to put their child in lessons. Well, they're going to pay for the, the most expensive teacher, me. Um, um, they're not going to settle for the $20 a lesson teacher. They're going to go for the $35 a lesson teacher because he's obviously better. And, but the, but that person, he has lots of money. It, it's not really an issue for him, but somebody who has little money, that money is worth more to the person who has less of it. Would we agree with that? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, another scenario, just to sort of illustrate this is, um, let's say you have a, uh, you, you live in a desert and you have a well and and people come to this well and they need water and you're going to be selling them water you're not just going to be giving it away you're going to be selling it to them and 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 you're going to charge you know a thousand dollars a glass right now, somebody who's really, really thirsty and who has lots of money, they would pay $1,000 a glass, right? They have no other options. I mean, they could rob it from you, I guess, but they, they have the money to afford it. And so they're going to pay you $1,000 a glass. So you sell them a glass of water for $1,000. Are they going to want to pay $1,000 for the second glass of water? No. No, they wouldn't. Why? Because the first would have given them the satisfaction that they were looking for. Yeah. So the first glass of water is more valuable than the second glass of water. Has the water changed? No. Usually not. Yeah, well, usually not. So there, there isn't an intrinsic value in the water itself. That is, you can't say water should cost this much. You know, if, you know, if you're going to um, go to a restaurant and you're going to buy some food and, and there's lots of restaurants to choose from, but the prices are going to be pretty affordable. You're going to find something that's, it's not going to seem overpriced. But if you're in a restaurant that's in on the top of a mountain, uh, you're going to pay quite a bit more for that food than you would in a restaurant that's in a well-populated area. Now, one of the things, of course, is the transportation of the workers there and the food being transported there, but also people are willing to pay more for something that they have less choice. So 
the idea here has to do with um, when we make a choice, when we decide the value of something, it's based upon a person, person's subjective assessment of how they want to make that choice. Do they want to spend that much money for an item? And that's not something that's equal. It's not even equal with the same person at different times. Just like when the person goes to get the glass of water, the first time they're willing to pay a premium for that first glass of water, but they know that that can get them through. They might pot pay a little bit more, you know, a bit, you know, they might want to have some water for the trip. Maybe they think that they can't get water somewhere else. But if they know that that glass of water will satisfy them till the next place, where they know that it's, you know, the water is going to be a lot less expensive, they're willing to wait until they get there. So, so something doesn't have an objective value. There is no way to value an item except for the person making an individual choice. So when the government tries to decide how much somebody should pay for something in a, in a controlled or demand economy, wage and price controls, which is a Keynesian idea, you know, how much should we pay for rent? How much should some landlord charge uh, to rent out his property? The government can't make that decision because they don't know what the costs are. And what happens when the government tries to control the economy? Well, one of the best examples of government control of the economy occurred in the United States during the 1970s. Mm -hmm. President uh, Nixon yeah. enacted what was called a wage and price freeze. Mm -hmm. You had phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Mm -hmm. All the way through this, you could not change specific prices. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I can remember this is that my parents were starting a business at that time. And there was quite a bit of unrest because of the changes in prices. It did not mean that there were not pressures to change prices. Mm -hmm. Because you had too many goods chasing too few dollars mm -hmm. so you had you had very upwardly trending inflation during that time which was what nixon sought to control but it right. didn't work right and it doesn't work because the government cannot control these things right well and and because it can't because what you end up happening if the government undervalues something, well, it will be bought up. You'll just end up with scarcity, right? It's, it would be like the gas wars you had in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that ended in disaster. <laughs> yeah. Well, from, well, from it, the it, point, it watching, right? From the point of what Mr. Nixon did, throughout the 1970s into the 1980s. It wasn't until Reagan and the free market economy practices that he reintroduced that we finally started to see inflation somewhat being controlled. Yeah. Well, infl inflation is kind of a natural part of growth. So inflation isn't bad as long as it's not rapid inflation. Right. Well, because because inflation increases because wealth increases. Right. I mean, if it's proper inflation. So so when the government interferes in the market, it changes the production, because why would somebody build something uh, or produce something that if they sell it, they can't make a profit? Okay. 
right? So if, if the government says, for instance, like when they put rent control and they say, well, you can't raise your rent, what happens to the houses, to the apartments that, um, that the landlord can't charge more rent for? Do they get improved? Are they fixed up? No, they're not. They deteriorate, right? You get slum landlords because the, the landlord has to get a return on his investment. And if, and if he's going to improve the property and you can't raise the rents, well, then there's no reason to improve the property. And, and, and that could actually ruin him too if he had to put too much into the property. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of problems that governments never really consider. So when we're, and we're trying to discuss some basics of economics, and I know that there are differences of opinion of how things work. But the basic idea is that value is determined by the person's individual choices. It can't be determined ahead of time. We can't even know what we would want in the future. We can only make choices based upon what we see now. Now, we can defer um, our choices for something in the future, believing that I'm going to keep my money here now and not spend it on something I want because if I can save that money, I can buy something else that I may need in the future, right? Children don't usually have that ability. They get money, they want to spend it. But a person who has a bit of foresight can see, I can't just get money as soon, spend money as soon as I get it. I need to save it. I'm going to have bills that are coming up or I may want to save for something else, right? So the government can't decide that. You can't have a controlled economy. Even if you had computers running the, the economy, which is really what the World Economic Forum believes, they believe that, we, that computers can determine because we can interconnect everyone and we can basically tell people what they want. So it's not even just what people want, we can control them, we can limit their choices, and so we can guide and direct them to make the choices that we want so that the economy will run efficiently, there'll be less waste, etc. That's the idea behind the World Economic Forum, behind their economic policies. But there are problems with that. And one is what, what they will do in the end is destroy the economy, which probably is really the plan in the first place, whether the people involved know that or not, these ideas are meant to destroy uh, society. And, and the, I believe that. Yeah. Well, you know, Miss White's got a quote that says it: um, "The money man buyeth all the goods, and and the poor and the poor get." It's sort of like the poor get poor and the rich get richer. Okay. And then, and then ends up. Okay. So what Ellen White's talking about is what we call crony capitalism. Does anybody know what crony capitalism is? Where a few join together to control the goods of the many. And they have the power of the state behind them. Agreed. Because yeah. without the power of the state, they couldn't do that. And, and basically what the World Economic Forum is proposing is just a whitewashed uh, example of crony capitalism. Uh, during the pandemic, did Walmart have to close? No. But what about little independent... Uh, clothing yes, store. all of them yeah okay and and actually from a uh pandemic point of view it would have made sense to close the big stores and keep the small stores open that is the more people you have going to a location the more chance that a virus could be spread so the smaller the location the less intersection you would have of these different populations. 
So if they had closed all the big stores and left the small stores open, uh, they would have had less spread of the virus, even though many cases the virus. Well, if you didn't. sold food, you could be open. If it was food, if it was just merchandise, you couldn't stay open. Yeah, but but the thing is, Walmart could sell clothes, but small clothing stores couldn't. So what they should have done is closed the WalMarts and the big the big stores, and and just let the little stores. I mean, if they were actually concerned about spreading the virus, which they weren't. Well, Walmart sold food too. That's why they can stay open to sold food. Right. I understand that. I realize that, but they did. They didn't just let them only buy food there. <clears throat> right. Right. So, so, so yep. clothing stores weren't weren't really the issue. Small clothing stores. You know. So, the point is, it wasn't. It wasn't really based upon uh, models of how the virus was spread. It was based more upon. Uh, economics and especially large corporations large corporations weren't affected by the pandemic small businesses were some of them not all of them some businesses thrived during the pandemic one is there was a lot more consumer spending going on during the pandemic uh, for goods because services weren't available right so large part of the part of the economy in the United States, about 70% or so is, is service industries. Um, and a lot of those were shut down food, restaurants, um, but but it changed. So you know, people had food delivered to them, it took a little while for that change to happen. Now, as far as well, let's look at one other aspect of of how people think about the economy and how they think about government. Now, of course, I live in Alberta. So in Alberta, we're pretty independent minded. Uh, but I had a person working at the guitar store and he was from Ontario. So he's from what we call Eastern Canada, though technically they consider themselves Central Canada. Um, because that's where that's where the control of the country lies. And and I had a conversation with him one time, and he believed that the government had his best interest in mind, and that he he believed that we should allow the government to make decisions for us because the not, government not only uh, knows what is best, uh, but they actually have our interest in mind. Now, does the government know what's best for anyone? Absolutely how, not. How can they know? How can they possibly know what's not in in my best interest? Uh, because they can't know my individual situation. I mean, they can look at statistics of what they think people want, but that's not going to help each individual. But also, is the government interested in what's best for me? No. No. Like anyone, the people who work in the government, who run the country, um, they're interested in what benefits them. And there's thousands of examples that can be used. You know, once a government, for instance, uh, creates a department or, uh, or creates something where money is being spent, uh, the role, the primary role of that department or bureaucracy is to continue to maintain its existence. Um, <clears throat> what's his name? I'm trying to think of his name. Um, the black economist, uh, Thomas Sowell. I don't know how many of you know of him. But he talks about at a time when he, his first job he got was working for the government. He was working in a department dealing with um, um, uh, minimum wage. So they had created this department uh, to in uh, to advise and control minimum wage. 
and I can't remember the details of it, but he had figured out um, that this minimum wage law was it not actually beneficial. And no one in the department was interested in what he had to say because their interest was in continuing this department. They were not willing to look at any research that would show that minimum wage wasn't beneficial because it was beneficial to them. And, and this is the way that government works. This is the way that everyone works. People act according to what they see as their best interest. And they may rationalize altruistic or um, other sort of notions uh, in why they're doing what they're doing. That is, they're not going to uh, think that what they're doing is going to harm others. They will rationalize how it benefits others. So governments may imagine that they're helping, uh, but they're not necessarily helping. Now, I'm going to look at this um, paper here. So this is uh, the paper on COVID-19, the Great Reset. We're going to look at some of these economic ideas as they're expressed by the World Economic Forum. Now, this first one here, um, it says the economic fallacy of sacrificing a few lives to save growth. What they're going to be discussing here is some people think that we that we shouldn't have worried about saving lives because if we destroy the economy, lives are going to be lost. And so they're going to be attacking this fallacy. So here's what they say. Throughout the pandemic, there has been a perennial debate about saving lives versus saving the economy, lives versus livelihoods. This is a false trade-off. From an economic standpoint, the myth of having to choose between public health and a hit to the GDP growth can easily be debunked. Now, of course, when they're talking about the economy, they're going to use this term gross domestic product, the growth in the gross domestic product as the example of the economy. Why do they use this term GDP growth in this uh, debunking? Why are they using that term? Because they're trying to show aggregate growth. Yeah, and, and there, it's also depersonalizing economy, right? No disagreement. Right. If they had to say the myth of choosing between uh, a perceived health uh, threat to public health and um, attacking and destroying uh, small businesses that support families, uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't have the same uh, uh, impact, right? So, so they're going to try to look at it in the most impersonal way that they can. It's a choice between public health, which of course everybody agrees is important, and GDP growth. Well, GDP growth is something so impersonal, and it's it's more about big business and everything, right? So, so that's one of the reasons why they're using this uh, this type of language. So it says, leaving aside the not insignificant ethical issue of whether sacrificing some lives to save the economy is a social Darwinian proposition or not, deciding not to save lives will not improve economic welfare. So what they're saying is that this is a false idea, that the economy um, is, is actually going to be benefited by saving lives. That's going to be their, their argument. Now, of course, they've set up really a, what we call a, a false dichotomy. That is, they're presenting a choice as if there's only two choices, when it's actually much more complicated than that. Um, so they're going to give these reasons. So they talk about supply. So there's this thing called supply and demand. And so they say on the supply side, if prematurely loosening the various restrictions, and the rules of social distancing result in an acceleration of infection, which almost all scientists believe it would, more employees and workers would become infected and more businesses would just stop functioning. Now, of course, in the case of this pandemic, 
who was affected by the virus? What, what people would be most likely to die? It would just be the elderly. So it wasn't the young. Uh, the young weren't really affected by this pandemic. No, the small businesses and so. Right. Yeah, but I'm just saying as far as getting sick, uh, most young people would not really get sick. They're not, definitely not going to die, even if they just had a, a bad cold from from the virus. Right. The elderly. Elderly. The elderly, elderly, definitely they would be the ones that would be at risk. But shutting down the economy, that wouldn't help the elderly, would it? Well, it wouldn't help the elderly and it wouldn't help those with pre-existing health conditions. Right. So now, now one of the things that they talked about, of course, we all remember, you know, flattening the curve. Uh, you know, this two week thing that we had to put up with. Um, Obviously, they exchanged weeks for years, so they're using a prophetic principle there. But um, we know that, I mean, that was just a story they were telling us, just to get the initial compliance. So uh, they knew that they were going to have to shut down the economy for a long time. Now, the question is, why would they do this? I mean, it wasn't rational. And you can see here they have these reasons of believing that, well, this pandemic was just so dangerous. But we know the pandemic wasn't. Now, some people will say, well, if we hadn't done anything, way more people would have died. But actually, if the government had not intervened and the media hadn't created such a frenzy, about and fear, uh, really the, the world wouldn't have been that affected by it. You would have had a lot of old people die. You would have a lot of infirm people die sooner than they would have. The pandemic would have went through the population much more quickly. Um, obviously the hospitals would have, they would have had to uh, change some of what they did as far as uh, providing uh, services for those that were sick, right? And in the United States, they did that. I mean, what did Trump initially do when we had the pandemic? Did he increase the number of beds available for those that would be sick? Yes. Yeah. And were they bed these beds used? No. He had a he had a ship, a cruise ship, full of beds, medical yeah, ship. Okay. They didn't even use that. The military ship and the military set up, all <laughs> kinds of, but they never had the influx of patients. No. <laughs> but the thing is, if they had, they would have been prepared for it. They were, it was actually not that difficult to prepare uh, to treat people who are sick. And they definitely could have done this if there was a massive pandemic that was going to hospitalize people. They could have easily set up hospitals that just addressed those who had COVID. And that's normally what they would have done in the past. That's how they dealt with things like the Spanish flu. But the governments weren't willing to do that. Instead, they were going to do something that was much more expensive, and that was shutting down the economy. It, it was completely irrational. Now, part of this is the World Economic Forum had an influence upon what actions were taken. That is, the World Economic Forum had looked into this beforehand. So in Canada and the United States, uh, they gave all kinds of stimulus money. They gave all these, these checks to us, just money for free. Uh, in Canada, it was like $4,000. Um, and this was something that was suggested beforehand that this was what they believed they needed to do. When you have a pandemic, you shut down the economy, and then you give all this money to people. Uh, one is it makes people more compliant. But it doesn't actually help the economy. It does, I mean, and initially it seems to, because people have money now to spend that they didn't have before, and so they buy guitars. 
At least that's what happened here. Um, but people had money and they got more money. So they just bought a lot of goods, but it put a pressure upon, upon uh, production because many of these companies were shut down who were producing. It affected the whole supply chain. And so in the long term, it actually was counterproductive. But um, they're going to deal here with on the supply side. So they're saying that um, people are going to get sick, and so companies are going to have to shut down. But, you know, what if you had everyone sick, if everyone got COVID on the same day? How long would everyone be sick for? About a week. Okay, so about a week or two, right? And, and the pandemic would have been over. So by slowing, flattening the curve and slowing the spread of the pandemic, they actually lengthened uh, the time of suffering. Now, the idea was initially so that they could get ready and get set up for the results of the pandemic. But instead, this kept going on and on and on. And, and this, again, was counterproductive. It allowed the, the, the virus to, to change, to get all these different variations, these different variants of the virus. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened if everybody just, had just gotten sick in a short period of time. So, I mean, of course, we didn't know exactly at first how deadly the virus was, but it didn't take us long to realize it wasn't it wasn't going to be the disaster that they predicted initially. And, and we can see, looking back, it, it, a lot of people died who wouldn't have died in that period of time. But most of them were people who would have died within a short period of time. Because these were very old people or people who were very sick already. So, so what they're arguing, though, is that uh, in order to save the economy, we need to shut down the economy because it's going to be shut down by the virus anyway. But that's not even logical. And I'm not saying just letting it naturally occur is, is, is the thing, but each situation is different. Every economy, every society, every situation was different, and it didn't make sense to have a one-size-fits-all approach and this is one of the things that they didn't like, is they don't like governments acting on their own. So they're going to talk about this on the de demand side. Uh, on the demand side, the argument boils down to the most basic and yet fundamental determinant of economic activity, sentiments, because consumer sentiments are what really drive economics. A return to any kind of normal will only happen when and not before confidence returns. Now, is this true that consumer sentiments are what drive economics? What is he trying to say here? Is this true? Well, it's more consumer needs. It's more needs, right? Now, the idea is that sentiments drive economy is in a Keynesian idea. This is Keynesian economics being expressed here. But it's not, it's not sentiments. It's, it's the market that drives the economy and the market is based upon choices that people make, individual choices on a large scale. They, they create, they drive the economy. But these choices are based upon needs and wants, not sentiments. Now, if this was true, uh, we know that the government had control of the media. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it just have been simpler for them to just make people feel that there was nothing really bad going on? Couldn't they have just controlled the sentiment of the population by downplaying the pandemic? Yeah. Okay. No, instead, and, and instead, of course, they fed the fear. 
because all we got was a constant diet of of fear with no balanced sort of perspective on the pandemic at all. So the idea that individuals' perceptions of safety, safety drive consumer and business decisions, I don't know if that's even close to being true, um, but also they seem to have the ability to, con to control people's perceptions. So I would think that they would have acted differently. So they say, which means that sustained economic improvement is contingent upon two things, the confidence that the pandemic is behind us, without which people will not consume and invest. And that's not true. Actually, in fact, consumer spending went up at the time that they had written this, that wasn't the case. But in the second, uh, the second half of 2020, uh, consumer spending skyrocketed. The demand for goods went up and into 2021. So um, people want to consume things especially if they have nothing to do. So it's, it's not true that people will not consume and invest. And in fact, a lot of investment happened. That is, in spite of their desire to destroy the economy, to a large degree, uh, the economy was resilient because people had needs. And those needs just happened to be met in different ways. So people couldn't go to restaurants. Well, now you had people delivering the foods to people's homes. You had actually created a whole sort of economy uh, and jobs that had never existed before. Um, so, so people make choices, and those are choices are economic choices. The problem that we have here is you have people who think that they understand how the economy works, and they think that they can... Um, use these sort of simplistic models uh, to decide what is best for people on an individual level. And of course, people are always going to decide what's in their best interest. Now, you can distort that market. You know, for instance, when it came to the vaccine, most people wouldn't have gotten the vaccine, or at least a large portion of people would not have got vaccinated without being forced to or being scared to, or being manipulated in some way. And so the media and pharma and the government and big tech all were involved in distorting the, the fear, so in distorting the risk that was there, and also distorting the benefit that you would get from being vaccinated. So if people had been fully informed, I think no, not many people would have been vaccinated, especially young people, because there was actually to them, where the vaccine vaccine actually had it, carried a greater risk uh, than the than the virus itself. So they say here the logical conclusion to these two points is governments must do whatever it takes, and spend whatever it costs in the interest of our health and our collective wealth, for the recovery. To, for the economy to recover sustainably. As both an economist and a public health specialist put it, only saving lives will save livelihoods. Now, of course, we have had real pandemics in the past. Uh, the Black Death removed, what, one third of the population of Europe? And uh, something like that. Spanish. What was the Spanish flu? What was the Spanish flu? Yeah, well, the Spanish flu. It, I, I think, it would have been lower than that, but uh, I think it was about ten percent of the population. No, I, it's closer, fifteen to twenty. Okay, fifteen to twenty percent. Um, did the economy recover quickly? The economy overheated. And we wound up in a depression soon after. Yeah. Now, of course, the depression was caused by government intervention. At least the lengthening of the depression was. Yes. Right. So, um, yeah. So you had a lot of people. So people dying um, isn't really going to affect the economy. And why is that? 
Like it's not going to affect the common economy negatively. Does anybody know why that is? As long as you have a sizable population left, it's not going to. Right, because because that person no longer is a consumer and also no longer a producer. Right. Yeah. The only thing that you might have is there might be some capital goods left over that aren't that that have built up that you know that person would have consumed later in their life. Um, but really, the economy is not dependent upon uh, people's public health. Now, the other thing about the interests of public health, what, what is the problem with the idea of public health from an economic point of view? So they say, only saving lives saves livelihoods, making it clear that only policy measures that pay, place people's health at the, their core will enable an economic recovery, adding, if governments fail to save lives, people afraid of the virus will not resume shopping, traveling, or dining out. This will hinder economic recovery, lockdown, or no lockdown. So, I mean, there's a major problem here, and it's the idea of public health. Who's, whose interest is my health? Yeah, it should be mainly yours. You, you're your, yeah. Well, it's actually Heidi's interest. Um, but yeah, so the only one interested in my health is is the people affected by my life directly, which would be me and, and Heidi. And, you know, maybe my kids care a little bit. But the government has no concern about public health. They don't have any interest in how my life is going, right? And we can see that by their callousness when it came to uh, the pandemic. Did the government care about how they were hurting individuals with, with the lockdown? Did they care about how they were hurting individuals by trying to force them to be vaccinated? Nope. Nope. No, not at all. Very, very few in government that cared. I can name them on one hand. Yeah, so mostly they just care about their position, the public perception of what they're doing. So governments were pressured by the media to act in a certain way. It was basically uh, not really their choice because if they wanted to be perceived as doing something, they had to act in the way that they did. And definitely there was no real concern. They, of course, they will share sentimental language about how it's terrible that anybody died uh, from the pandemic, but they would take actions that really in no way uh, benefited people. Now, people, because your, your health is your interest, are you going to act in a way that you perceive to be beneficial to your health for the most part? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So you're going to make decisions based upon the knowledge that you have and what you think is in your best interest. You're the only one who really can decide that. The government can't decide that. And, and this is, I mean, this is just such a simple idea. But yet we live in a world where people believe that the government creates the economy and that the government should be responsible for my health, and that's backwards, because the government has no interest in either of those things. They're not interested in economy that's going to benefit the individual, me particularly. They're only concerned about how it affects them, whether it's just in their re-election or whether it's in them personally, financially. So, I mean, anybody should be able to see that these ideas are false. But the thing is, we've been programmed or brainwashed for a long time to believe 
that government is actually seeking, can know what is best for us, for one thing, but also that it's seeking to provide what's best for us. And that can't possibly be the case. Um, I think I had one more thing. No, this is the next section. Now let's um, let's go back to the scriptures here. So when it says that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So I'm just gonna share this here. We can see that the government isn't really interested in what's benefiting the individual. Because if you're forcing a person that they can't buy or sell, that they're going to be marginalized, you definitely can't be considering that person's, what's, what's in that person's best interest. Now, uh, the one thing I wanted to address here just before we end here, we got about 10 minutes. So when we deal with Revelation 13, and we see this economic aspect here, is there something here that's also symbolic? Like, are we just going to take this literally? We have to take it symbolically. Okay. So, so we look at this, and I think generally we just think of it in the literal sense. We're going to have this mark on us, and we're not going to be able to buy or sell. But we know when we look at Revelation 18 and it talks about the merchants of the earth um, and, and then mourning the loss of Babylon, that it's more than just about economics. It uses this economic imagery. And why is the Bible using this economic in imagery? What is it trying to convey? Right, so we have Revelation 18, which has the fall of Babylon, and it mentions all these merchants. And they're mourning the loss. Why are they doing this? Literally or figuratively? Figuratively. What's going on? Uh, could it relate to Mark 8, 36 through 38, where Christ is asking, you know, though you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, what profit is it? Like, what can you give in exchange for a soul? And of course, there's a battle for souls between Christ and Satan. It's been ongoing for eons. Okay, so what do these things represent? What does this, all of these material goods symbolize? And what do the merchants symbolize? Well, those who are putting a price on us, I guess, like we're all part of the vast corporation. Okay. Any other thoughts? Where is that verse? I think it's in Hosea or somewhere. It says he is a merchant. The balances of this seat are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. Okay, so so this is deceit and oppressing. Okay, well let's look at Isaiah uh, chapter forty-seven. So this is a parallel chapter to. Revelation 18. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover thy th the thigh. Pass over the rivers. The nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. 
I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. For as our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. I was wroth with my people, I have polluted mine inheritance, and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. And thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the, the latter end of it. So when we're looking at this woman here, it's Babylon is described as a woman, which we get in Revelation in, um, 17 and 18. So what is she doing? What is this merchandise? What is what is it that Babylon is selling? Control. Okay. Um, well, Babylon wants to have to control over us, but explain what you mean by that. Well, when we go back to the Tower of Babel. Okay. All were able to communicate because they spoke with one language. Okay. Here, instead of speaking with one language, they want to be able to control others with one economic format. Because if they control them, then they speak for them, and then every the supposed intelligentsia are the ones that are in charge and they're telling those that they see as being their human cattle okay now isn't this also though about worship like how does the worship fit into that idea well if you have one one method of worship then there's only going to be one place where that worship is going to be directed Okay. Um, now it says in uh, uh, verse eight here, therefore hear now this, thou art given to pleasures that dwellest, dwellest carelessly. Now that means she dwells carelessly. What does it mean carelessly? We, we wouldn't use it that way nowadays. Dwelleth without thought? Without, without worry, without care, right? You have everything that you need, everything is provided. That saith in thine heart, I am none, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come in to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection, for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantment, enchantments. So sorceries refers to what here? What did we say that the sorceries that are illustrated in Revelation 15 or 18 and also in Leviticus 18, what is sorceries referring to? Beside pharmakeia? Well, yes, not pharmakeia. That is, pharmakeia is a, a symbol representing what? Because that's sorceries. A combination of church and state, Iran says, right? That is uh, fornication with an animal, a beast, right? That's what's talked about in Leviticus 18.23, and it lines up with pharmakia in Revelation 18.23. And we can see here this same, this is describing, basically this is Revelation 18, Isaiah chapter 47, and it's going to talk about the multitude of thy sorceries. This is the state taking control away from the individual to make their choices. So this woman, Babylon, what is the problem with her? She wants full control of everything not yielding it to god right agreed 
I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but does not recognize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So the church is infected with this same spirit. And this is the spirit of the world, this self-sufficiency apart from God. We recognize as Christians, we can be self-sufficient in God. That is, God has given us the ability to act and do things. But our trust is in God. It's not in unrighteousness and wickedness. So when we look at Revelation 18, and it talks about these merchants, well, wouldn't these merchants be those that have been selling us the bill of goods? To use a colloquialism. Aren't these the ones that have been deceiving the world? Doesn't this represent the media? Yes. To a large degree, that would be the case. And the educational system. Well... I'm looking more at the media because it's the media that has been, as you just stated, selling a bill of goods. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we know, of course, this is figurative. You know, these aren't really merchants who are mourning the loss of Babylon. These are those that have been uh, presenting this narrative, these ideas that are contrary to God's word. And, and, and so it's not talking about individuals as merchants mourning the loss of Babylon. So this wealth, this, these riches, these are these false sense of security. Um, that is being presented to the world, right? So the one thing, you know, that, that bothers me, and I really don't know how to, to say this without being callous, um, um, but I dislike the idea that um, there's such a thing as public health that, that I should be concerned about the health of someone else. Now that, that sounds kind of callous, but I'm just saying from a practical point of view, I can't really care for every person that lives in the world, that is in, in any sort of practical sense. I can't know what's best for someone else. I have to assume that if people are free to make their own decisions, they're going to make the best decisions that they can make. And that I need to be able to free to be free to make the best decisions I can make. I wouldn't want to be in the situation where I believed that I could decide for other people what's in their best interest in, in the area of health. If people are informed, people can make decisions. They can decide to do this or that. They can decide if they want to go to work. If they believe that it's a risk for them to go to work, they would voluntarily not go to work. You don't need the government stepping in and deciding for them how they should act. And so what we saw in the pandemic, I think does relate to the Sunday law, not so much about the economy, but really it has to do with the ability of people to make their own choices. And that's what's going to be taken away from us. Not that we, we obviously can make our own choices, but that's what they're seeking to do. To make the state, in a sense, become God. Because does God have my best interest in mind? Always. Always, right? I can trust him. And not only does he have my best interest in mind, he has the means to actually provide for me. He sustains my life. And he's also interested in my eternal salvation, the eternal good, 
where the state is no interest in either. They have only interest in what they can gain. So the idea, and many people can see it, that the World Economic Forum is a bad thing. But we, especially if we're older, we can't imagine that actually the majority of the population would agree with the World Economic Forum. But it is the case. The reason why they don't hide what they're doing is because it's actually popular. I know that's hard for us to believe, but it is. It's popular. Socialism, Marxism, whatever kind of word you want to put to it, where the idea that the government will take care of us is a very popular idea. In fact, they believe that the government is the one that really creates wealth. And, and they stop people from, from being greedy and taking wealth. That if the government didn't step in, we would just have all these money grubbing uh, capitalists uh, taking advantage of us. Not realizing that only occurs when you have crony capitalism, when you have uh, business in bed with government. And those are things like regulation. So I know there's some place in the states, some, some states, where if you want to be a florist, you have to uh, be registered as a florist. You know, somebody can't just pick some flowers from the garden and go sell them on the street. They would actually be arrested. It's a crime. And who do you think likes the regulation regarding florists? Wouldn't it be florists that like those regulations? Correct. They're actually the ones who brought about and lobbied the government to bring in regulations. So regulations usually protect uh, special business interests that don't want competition. And the belief is the bigger business we have, the bigger government we have, uh, the more efficient they are. But actually the colliery, colliery is true. The opposite is true. Big business is less efficient. Big government is less efficient. The government is extremely inefficient at taking the tax money and, and creating services with it than if it was done uh, by individuals taking that money and using it. So anyway, this is sort of a, a very bad crash course on economics that you just experienced. But at least we had a discussion about it. We know that uh, however we want to look at the ideas of the World Economic Forum, these ideas are, are only going to destroy the economy. They're going to take away the rights of individuals to make their own choices, not just economically, but in every single way. They remove privacy because if you have um, – government dictating and controlling every aspect of the economy. If I want to go someplace and I have to uh, go online and book a car that's going to come and pick me up, an automated car, and drive me to my destination, I can't just go someplace privately. Somewhere a record is being kept of everything that I do of every choice and decision I make, because it's necessary for them to decide how they're going to allocate the services. And this is the problem. And this sets up the world for this type of control. It puts the power into the hands of the state. Now, of course, it's not just the state. We know that it's also going to be the church. So as we talked about in, in an earlier study, dealing with um, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, when we're looking at the World Economic Forum, we're really looking at the dragon power. 
This is not necessarily a religious power, though it's going to be connected to the false prophet and to the papacy. But what it's going to bring about is not the plan that they want to implement necessarily, though I think to some degree it's going to be implemented. But it's mostly going to be a destruction of the economy. And as they destroy the economy, what ends up happening? What does the state do when they destroy the economy? What actions will they take? When you have Russia despotism, but I mean, they have to destroy it to build back better in their view. Yeah. Yeah, well, definitely they need to destroy the economy. I don't know if that's necessarily what they think they're doing. They might think they're, they're actually helping. But when they destroy the economy and you have um, the people revolting, because they will, um, definitely despotism will set in. That is, people will have to be controlled If they allowed people to be to make their own choices, they they wouldn't have the problem that they're going to face. But I would think that ultimately, on the top of level, that they really believe that that they need to destroy the economy, whether it's to depopulate the world or whatever belief that they have. Um, they don't care about the individual; they just care about themselves. And so they're going to act in their best interest. And their best interest isn't going to be our best interest. So anyway, I hope that was helpful. I know that it, it definitely doesn't cover every aspect of economics. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I think that this was a very informative session. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Okay. Well, let's, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for the study that we had this afternoon. And we know, Lord, that um, as we look at this world, we see that the only ones that will really care for others is those that have the spirit of Christ operating in their heart. We pray, Lord, that we can care for those around us, that we can show Christ's love, and that we can spread the gospel as the, the antidote uh, to the despair and fear that exist in this world. We pray, Lord, that um, we can continue to study and understand your word. We know that we know very little, um, but we are thankful for the light that you have given us. Help us to follow and serve you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.